All right, so um, my name is Liz Smith. Um, sorry, my name is Liz Smith, um, and I'm an MFA. That's a Master of Fine Arts. Somebody was asking earlier um, what that stands for. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about science communications um, just for a little bit here. Um, before I get going about communicating science, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself, what I'm doing here, what I study. Um, so I started out doing an uh, undergraduate degree in astronomy. Um, I was inspired by a high school teacher, uh, my physics teacher actually, who put science in my hands rather than in a book. Um, and when I went to Whitman College, um, we had the very first week of class. Uh, the very first week of class, there were all kinds of activities, and you didn't have to choose your major just yet. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to study physics, but I actually went and saw a screening of Contact, the Carl Sagan uh, film. And I was inspired to study astronomy from that film. Um, and then after I, well, over the four years of doing my undergrad, um, I discovered that I actually enjoyed telling stories about science much more than I enjoyed doing science. And I'm also a little bit ADD, so studying one thing for my entire life would be a bit much. I really enjoyed jumping around between the sciences. So I went to Montana State, and I got a Master of Fine Arts in Science and Natural History Filmmaking. Um, and I was one of the only science people there. Uh, most of the people there were wildlife folks, so we did a lot of shooting of, uh, of buffalo and wild animals and things like that. It was mostly people who wanted to make documentaries for Discovery Channel. Um, and then while I was at Montana State, the opportunity came up to do a fellowship at NASA. Um, and I ended up staying there for about four or five years. Um, and I worked in the astrophysics department there. Um, and actually, I uh, had the luck to be there um, when Professor Smoot and, and John Mather won the Nobel. Um, and I got to work with his um, co-Nobel recipient um, on his outreach for winning the Nobel Prize. Um, and a lot of what I did there was documentary, it was social media, um, things like communications plans for satellites. If you guys have heard of the Fermi satellite, um, I did all of their original communications plan. Um, and then as luck would have it, in about 2008, I ended up uh, jumping ship, so to speak, or jumping on a ship. I started doing ocean exploration work. Um, and I left NASA to go to the Waite Foundation, um, which was sort of my entree into working with a lot of ocean explorers. So I've actually spent the last six years or so working on research vessels, uh, doing interactions with teachers live from the boat, um, and working with groups like National Geographic and Woods Hole and uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and so the reason that I'm here, um, actually I came through the Faculty of Science um, and Aaron McAuliffe, who's in the audience, who's a marine geologist, um, to come to the university here on a Fulbright uh, fellowship and work with the department to help enable their, their staff and their faculty and their scientists to better communicate their research. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, and I was lucky enough to be invited to speak to you guys about science communications because it fits with exactly what you're trying to learn here. So enough about me, let's get to the science communications. I just wanted to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. I have a bit of a science background, I'm not a scientist, um, but I have about 10 years of experience doing uh, communications work and helping scientists. So the first thing I wanted to do is just sort of give you guys a layout of science communications um, and communicating science and the world of science communications. So most people, when you think of science communications, when you say, oh, I'm a science communicator, I communicate about science, they think about popular media. Um, and popular media is, basically the audience is everyone. Um, and usually it's science communicators, sometimes it's scientists doing the communicating. Um, and these are things like popular documentaries, books, um, magazines, uh, movies like Contact, um, and even sci-fi, right? Um, and another sort of realm of science communications is education and outreach. Um, you guys are used to a lot of this. this the audience is students, kids. Um, and a lot of this sort of world is things like textbooks, museums, planetariums, um, IMAX films. Uh, people like Bill Nye the Science Guy, if you're talking about television, and even things like Dr. Seuss. Um, and then there's a whole other realm of science communications that people don't necessarily think of when they think of science communications, which is academia. 
And the audience is more of a peer-to-peer -peer audience. And that's things like journals, papers, posters, presentations, textbooks. And then the last world that's sort of part of this that also people don't think about that I've actually done a fair amount of um, is the business end of things, which is communicating science to people who fund you. Um, and that in, has generally been things like annual reports, grants, paperwork, right? Um, and there's a reason I want to tell you about that. Um, so, hold on just a second, let me look at my notes. Um, so this is sort of the layout of the world of science communications. Um, everything's sort of in a se separate little sphere. Um, but this is changing, right? I would actually label this 20th century science communications, right? This is sort of the way we've been doing it. This is what we were all raised on. This is what inspired all of us to do the work that we do. Um, so what does 21st century science communications look like? It looks a little bit more like this. And this is ever-changing. Um, so this, isn't, this is my idea of what it looks like. Um, and we don't know where it's going to end up in another 10, 20, 30 years. Um, you still see a lot of the same things, obviously. There's still a core of documentary, academic journals, museums, of course. Um, but one of the things that changes the audience has gotten sort of mashed up and mixed up. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so at the core of this, you see a lot of changes going on. Um, one of the things that's happening is that the general public's actually doing more science. Um, you have scientists who are directly teaching the general public. So students now aren't just sort of your normal academic students, university students or school kids, they're the general public. Um, you have things like Jason Learning where they actually take scientists and, direct, and directly interact with students in classrooms. So now teachers aren't teaching students, the scientists are teaching students straight from in the field. Um, you have things like Kickstarter and Experiment and Rocket Hub that help, that take crowdfunding and fund science. So no longer are you doing, when you're talking about business, you're not just promoting the science or talking about the science that you do to a grantor um, in sort of a boring way. Now you have to make more of a popular media video to get the general public excited about your science. Um, you're also seeing social networks of scientists that the general public can jump on as well. Um, you're seeing open access journals of scientists. This is a big change too, is that there's a lot, of le there's a lot less gates, which um, in terms of communications is things like uh, when you wanted to make a documentary in the past, you had to go through a gate. You had to talk to a producer at National Geographic to get it on television. Now you can just go make one, right? So things like open journals, and there's a lot of controversy about this, but now anyone can go publish a science paper, which is kind of crazy. Um, you're also seeing more games being used in education for students, and you're also seeing games being used to get the general public to do science. Um, if you guys don't know Fold It, um, Google it. It's a super cool project where they actually make games that get the general public to play them, and it's things like mapping proteins and um, trying different ways in, of um, putting them together, and they've actually solved a number of scientific problems with this. So at the core of all this, oh, and TED Talks too, we were actually just talking about TED Talks. Um, this is also something too where science presentations are now general public three minute sound bites right online. That's also changed. So um, at the center of all this, of course, social media, the internet. Um, if you find it somewhat overwhelming, you have my permission to be totally overwhelmed. Um, I couldn't even tell you what maybe a third of those icons are. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, so, and it's also still shifting, so um, we don't know what it's going to look like in 10 years. So what I want to do is take sort of that overwhelming sense that there's all this stuff going on and all these things are now mashing up and getting combined and look at what the major themes are. Um, and these are going to be the things as you go out and create your own science communications, you're going to want to sort of aim for these kinds of, of themes. Well, I'll actually aim for them, but keep them in mind. So the first one is social. Um, so we've gone from sort of segmented, um, what we call one-to-many communications. So in communications, there's one-to-many is one person speaking to many people. Uh, many-to-many would be a social network. It's where everyone's having sort of a conversation. I guess you could have many-to-one if you had maybe uh, an entire group write letters to a 
political figure. That might be a many to one type of communication. Um, so it's much more about community, right, and social. Um, it's also incredibly interactive. So we've gone from mediated to interactive uh, communications where the audience are becoming the participants. Um, a lot of times they're becoming the main character in the story. There's a lot of choose your own adventure type communications going on right now. Um, and we're going from observation to, to immersion. Um, it's also open. Um, it's uh, sort of uh, the democratization um, that the internet allows um, in communications. Um, as I was saying before, we've sort of gone from this gated entry to things to being open to anyone. Um, so you no longer have to talk to a filmmaker to make a film. You can make your own film and share it. Um, integrative. So this is just the concept that things are getting mashed up, right? We're seeing a lot more arts and sciences coming together. So you see a lot of scientists doing art, a lot of artists trying to convey science. Um, and then it's also saturated, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. There's a lot more information for people out there, but we've gone from focused to really distracted. Um, and we don't really have a captive audience anymore, right? Like, there's a few people in the audience right now that are like checking their email, looking at their stuff, right? But they're listening, because I know when I, when I listen to talks, and I'll mention this uh, a little bit later, when I listen to talks, a lot of times I'm also doing other things, but I'm listening. I'm so all this stuff is going on, so how do you grab people um, into that? So the common denominator um, in all of these things and all these themes and trends is engagement, right? So the big question is, how do we engage people? Um, I want to talk about the ingredients of engagement. Um, and in the past, I think we talked a lot about story. So when you would talk to a science communicator, we'd talk to scientists about how do I get people excited about what I'm doing? And you'd say, oh, you have to tell a story. Um, and those, the things involved in a story might be um, you know, a hook, a conflict, and a resolution. Um, and I think that's no longer the case so much. Um, it's certainly the case if you're writing a book, if you're doing a long format documentary. Um, you can still tell stories in short format. You can tell a story on Twitter in 140 characters. Um, but, and they're still great, but it's not necessarily what we need today or what you need to get people to notice to be engaged in what you're doing. Um, so I think it's actually relatively simpler than having to create an entire story. Um, so, uh, and actually I, one example I had of that was, um, I don't know if the, the ice bucket challenge made it um, over to Malta, but um, that's actually, yeah. So, and you can argue about good, bad, there's lots of positives, there's lots of negatives about it, but if you're a person who's trying to get something to go viral, to get a lot of people to say donate or participate or learn something, um, it's pretty amazing. It went all over the place. They raised a lot of money. Um, and if you notice, there isn't really a story there. I mean, there's sort of a story behind each video, but for the most part, it's just engaging, right? Um, and so, why is it engaging? So, um, Here's sort of the three, the three things that I would say that need to be involved. So the first thing is people. Um, this happens a lot in science, we forget to add the people. Um, we do a lot of uh, charts and graphs and numbers and figures um, and we forget to put the people in. So how do we put people into something that we're trying to communicate about? Um, the first thing is to include characters. Um, the Ice Bucket Challenge actually made each person, the audience, the main character right, which was huge. I think that was a big part of why it went viral. So characters can be um, great people from science. It can be science communicators, also scientists. Um, it can be cartoons, it can be Cat in the Hat. Um, it could be fictional characters, um, and you can actually have fictional characters meet real life scientists. Um, another way to include humans is to create human context, right? So we see this a lot in, in science. Um, you can add, you can take things in everyday people's lives and connect them to what you're trying to explain. Um, Edward did this with his um, football example, football stadium in terms of distances to give you an actual practical idea of what we're talking about. Um, you can also put a human sort of uh, in what you're talking about. So this is another thing too that we do a lot um, in astrophysics, we say, oh, what if a person was near a black hole, what would happen, right? It makes people go, oh, if I was there, it connects them to the actual place. Um, and then um, Kiara talked about um, RAM pressure the other day of galaxies and mentioned, it's like when you have your hand out the window of a car, 
right? Automatically it was like, whoa, I know what that feels like. I know what that's like, right? It connects me to what we're talking about. If she had just talked about ram pressures and galaxies, I would have, okay, okay, you know. Um, it wouldn't have synced, but I'm still thinking about it. Next time I put my hand out the car window, I'm gonna think about that, right? Um, I think that also happened with um, James's talk as well. I, I know I was um, multitasking in the back, working on my presentation, and James was talking about dark matter, and he said something about how much dark matter is in this room. And I said, oh, I looked up, and I thought, oh my God, there's dark matter in this room, right? How many times do you hear that? I mean, you don't, usually dark matter, it's out there, right? The universe is out there. It's actually, it's right in this room. It kind of gave me shivers. I think, oh my God, it's actually here, right? It puts things in human contact, context. It makes it closer to you. Um, and then Professor Smoot also, he gave an example of this that was um, uh, with a world map um, that also puts it in context. Because you know what a world map's supposed to look like, so it gives you an idea um, of the difference between the Kobe and W map um, uh, resolutions. Um, and I actually use this example because another way that things like uh, the Kobe findings were, were uh, contextualized as it's the baby picture of the universe, right? Um, if the headlines had just been cosmic background radiation mapped, you'd be like, wow. But baby picture of the universe, everyone's like, what does it look like, right? Um, and it gives you an idea of exactly what it is. You know they're talking about the very start. Um, the last way to include uh, people is to enable an interaction, obviously putting science in the hands of people um, makes a big difference. I know as a really small kid, the thing that got me excited about science was going to museums that weren't just placards and things in cases, but um, I went to the Exploratorium in San Francisco as a kid, and that, that museum um, is actually just a giant play, fun exhibit space. You get to go put your hands on all of the science and actually experience it for yourself. Um, and even things like citizen science, right? SETI was a really early uh, sort of version 1.0 of modern day citizen science. Um, oh, uh-oh. Oh, hold on. I hit the wrong button. Where are we? Okay. We talked about people. If there's one thing that you take home from today's presentation about this, it's people, right? Um, if you don't include people, it's really hard for people to be engaged and connect with what you're talking about. Um, the other thing that I would talk about in terms of how to create engagement is to include things like universal truths. And universal is not necessarily an intended pun, um, but it certainly works for this crowd. Um, so what do I mean by universal truths? Um, I actually want to read you a poem. <laughs> um, and this is called When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. It's by Walt Whitman. Um, and it's, when I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, uh -oh. till, rising out, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself, in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. So um, this is not a literal critique of our astrophysicists that have been giving talks, right? Talks can be incredibly engaging. Um, the real point of this poem um, is the difference between um, what I would say are facts in the beginning of this and truth, right? Um, when you look up at the stars, you tap into something really universal about human experience. Um, and I think that's incredibly important to tap into. And you can do that in a presentation. Um, it's just that Walt Whitman used that as an example of that. Um, so how do, you, how do you tap into universal truth? It's really hard to pinpoint exactly what that is. I can't give you a formula for it. But it's things like wonder, awe, humor, danger, emotions. Um, and connections, right? It's creating connections to everyday people. It's the thing that, that connects all of us across of boundaries and disciplines. Um, and it's something that I think science has a really hard time with because we're so focused on facts and so much of science is about facts and not letting emotions get in the way of, of scientific problems. Um, and then the last thing that I would add to this 
mixture, uh, aside from people and universal truths, is simplicity. Um, and I'm not going to get too complicated with this one. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, and that's just keep it simple, keep it short, keep it quick. Don't make an hour-long documentary when you can say what you need to say in three minutes. Um, uh, you know, don't write a book if an essay will do. Um, don't make a movie if a photo will do. Um, especially with communication saturation and the way everyone is distracted today, trying to engage people means you've got to make it short and sweet and really hit home. Um, so that's sort of my little concoction for how to engage people. Um, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily anything new. Um, people have been doing it for a long time. Um, and the best example that I can come up with this in the realm of uh, astrophysics is uh, Carl Sagan. Um, he was incredible at engaging people. He also told stories, but even simple quotes that we still share, um, like this one about us being stardust, or we're from stars, right? You could give a whole calculated <laughs> lecture about how supernovas work and how elements are created. Um, and then at the end of the story, you get to talking about people. But really all you need is this. And if you look at this, if you look at this quote from Carl Sagan, right, there's people in it. So it's about us being made of stardust. There's also people in it because he talks about DNA, teeth, blood, apple pies. Those are things that put it in human context, right? Um, so not only is the, the audience for this quote the main character of the story, but they've put it, he's put it in context of um, everyday life. Um, he's also tapped into a universal truth, right? Um, where we came from. This is something that people really care about. Um, and it's also incredibly simple. So um, I'm about to wrap it up here uh, with... Engagement, um, once you have something that's incredibly engaging about uh, how you want to share, the next thing you have to really do is look at your audience. Um, and a mistake that I often see made, um, not just in science, but also in actually in a lot of environmental communications, is that people say that their audience is everyone. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that each audience is sort of on its own orbit. Um, School kids don't hang out in the same places online as adults do, as scientists do, um, as artists do, um, as business people do. Everyone's all over the place in different places. So the last thing that I would leave you with, um, aside from sort of focusing on trying to be engaging, um, is that when you start talking about audience, try to think about your audience and where they are, right? You don't have to use, you don't have to write a book and make a movie and be on Twitter and be on Facebook, right? If your audience is on Twitter, be on Twitter. If your audience reads books and they're not on Twitter, don't have a Twitter account, right? You don't have to do everything. What you really want to do is focus, um, focus your engagement towards an audience where they are. Um, so with that, um, I think I'll end. Um, thank you very much.